Hey, everybody, what is up this morning? That's right. Take a look at this. I've got my good friend Ralph Zerbonia, and he has the same problem that we do at Doyo or Do You Live. Not a lot of people get the last name right, but at least they're saying it, right, Ralph? Doyo. <laughs> Zerbonia. Here we go. We got both right. Anyway, we are talking today about NFTs, metaverse, blockchain, spatial computing. That's right. Computing without the use of these, your hands. And right now I have on a augmented reality headset. That's right. You have on the Microsoft HoloLens 2. Which is amazing because right now what I can see, what you can't see, is I have a computer screen in front of me. This is a $35, $35, $3,500 headset, by the way. So I'm going to be very careful not to fall off my chair this morning. Um, but Ralph, obviously people can't see what I can see in the, in the headset. But as we kind of get started in, in the conversation, get to learn about you, you said that I need to tap into a pin. You see where it wants you to put in the pin? Sure. Take your finger and go right into there and put the cursor in. I mean, jab right through it. You have to break the block. Uh, it'll make a sound when you Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay, and the keypad came up down below, right? Yeah. Okay, you want the pin number. Is the cursor in there and the keypad in sight? Okay. And, we, and it is web sign and pin. Now it didn't pop. It didn't pop the the keypad. Oh, you need a keypad up. So stick your finger into this um, square that you know the pin is going to go into. Put the cursor in there with your finger. Okay. Just jab right in. All right. Now, <laughs> like that. Like that. Yeah. Get in there and make sure you break the plane of light. Okay. Does that happen? It'll make a sound when you do it. It's not done it just yet, but my gosh, this is pretty interesting. I don't want to leave you there. If you want, you could hand it to me and I'll open it for you and then you could go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, and they also say that you can never go home. And the right exciting thing for me this morning is this. Uh, we are at the Youngstown, live at the Youngstown Business incubator um and uh when i first moved back to youngstown going on nine years ago i had a off a, a i had an office in the youngstown business incubator uh, for about the first first four or five years i'd moved back here jim costler ceo at the time of the ybi um had invited me to have a be a commercial tenant in the building which was um well received and i was very it's very good to be back seeing some familiar faces all right so I have in front of you a opening menu, a Windows menu. I do. And uh, just just so you know, look at look at your wrist like this. OK, do you see now look over at it? Do you see down at your wrist should be a start button? Yeah. Hit it with your finger Shut and up. you got rid of that spatial computing. What did we get rid of here? We got rid of the mouse. We got rid of the keyboard. We got rid of the monitor and it's all on your head and you, you just, you just open. If you look back at your wrist and do it again, you'll get that window back up. Wow. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> like, that's super cool. Like it, it gets better. You can, uh, I don't want to take you through this while, while people yeah. are watching. It's sort of like for them to watch paint dry. Yeah. But you could just use your finger to go in in that menu. And folks, you can see what he's doing. He's apparently just poking something in the air. But what he's poking at is a menu that has buttons on it. Yeah. And you want to break the... Is a ray of light coming out of your fingers? There is. Okay. You can also do this. Just let the front of the... Sort of turn your hand to the side. Put that... Um, put the cursor, if you will, where you want to click, and then just put your fingers together like that. But you have to do it where you sort of click on it. No, it, it's it, this is just amazing. This is just amazing. So, where where is this? What is the use case application? Oh, for yeah. so for spatial computing, this augmented reality where I've got no peripherals, right? I've got I'm taking away my mouse. I'm taking away, uh, you know, I've, I've got this in my headset. You showed me a video of a demo that I think Microsoft did where people were 
virtually in the same room with each other and right. things like that. Sitting around looking at each other and they were looking like, uh, you ever see Prometheus, the uh, movie? Remember the alien uh, holograms, how they looked? Right. They were sort of like spinning things. That's what mesh looks like. This does mesh and you put a connect camera in the room with the person and it does whole body, no avatar, no cartoon, whole body, uh, photorealistic right. view. And it, and it is you, by the way, it's, it's live you, uh, lips moving eyes. I mean, it's you and you're sitting at a table with 20 other people eat, and there's only one person at that table. Really? The other 19 have popped in holographically. And if you're wearing one of these, let's see what the difference is between these. You can't see through this. Right. This is a virtual reality. I've, got to, I've got to put a, a peripheral. Well, you have to connect it to a, a computer. Well, not necessarily, but you do. This has its own computer in it. This okay. is an Oculus Quest too. Right. So it comes with a computer in it. But what you do have to do is not walk around too much because you can't see, you can't see. where you're going. Right. OSHA frowns on doing this to workers on the factory floor. They sure. hate blind workers on the floor. Right. This you could see through. You were talking to me. As folks can see, it has a lens right here. If yeah. you want to, you can raise the lens. This is a piece of work equipment. That's why the difference is um, $300, $3,500. Right. The other thing about this and what you could do with it, um, the easiest way to explain it would be, I think you're, uh, remember back the Lord's time when they had that long assembly line? Well, there was different things going on. and There were different machines operating. The uh, the line supervisor is the person who would know if an emergency popped up and would he'd be running or shouting orders to somebody to shut down a machine if there was a problem. Sure. With this on, he doesn't have to move. Looks at his wrist, calls up the control panel, hits the button, and it's off. Okay. Um, another use case scenario. You know how they make molds today, and I mean the kind of molds you pour liquid into that will uh, harden up and then you have an item? Right. Um, they make them using a process that's actually ancient called the lost sand process. And what you do is you make in sand the thing that you want to have molded. and A core. Yeah. And then you... Uh, once you're done with that, you it's called lost sand because you get rid of the sand and you have your mold left. Right. Well, over at Hometown Products in Salem, um, there's a there is a line problem, an operational line problem with this, and that is when you look down into the box that these things are being formed in. They 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 take a 3D printer and they print six feet by three feet by three feet okay. of sand and mold material. Right. So it's going along, this is sand, then all of a sudden the line of mold material, then it's back to sand. So something's building up in there. They fill up the box with this stuff. But when you look down into the box, it's all sand on top. You can't see anything in the box. To get rid of the sand, they got to use a heavy-duty vacuum. Right. Occasionally, because you can't see what you're doing down below, if there's sand over it, that's why you're getting rid of it you nick a piece and that's an error that costs them money. They have to go make that piece over. So I'm talking to uh, Mark LaMancha who runs a place and we're, we were talking about using these for training. You can do all of your safety training on them. I mean, you saw what it was like. It's like, it's like somebody was a magician and put things in front of you that weren't really there right. and could make them do whatever they wanted them to do. No, so you could train people in this. Um, Mark comes back at me and says, but on the line, I can have a guy with one of these. And could you take the, the drawing of the molds and make it so that when he looked down into the box, it would act like an x-ray and show him where the molds were in the box? And then, well, how do you make, how do you, aren't you using CAD to make the screen printer do what it's doing? He's saying, yeah. I say, yeah, just as soon as you import the CAD drawing, it focuses on a barcode that's on top of the box. Sure. 
that becomes its reference point for measurement. And it has the it has the right size CAD drawing because that was the drawing that made the box. Right. It comes in and the guy looks down as soon as it focuses on the little barcode. From that moment on, it doesn't matter where he moves his head. The items in the box stay where they're supposed to stay. And he sees them like an x-ray set of lines with a skin on them that's a different color than the sand. Interesting. It's now really interesting. he knows where to avoid and, and that was Mark's whole thought. Um, we're going to see what that does. In places like Boeing, where they're using this on the line, they're making claims of zero errors, which is not something you're allowed to advertise. Sure. Okay. But they're making the claims because what they've done with their process is they've mimicked it where a hologram wraps itself around the real item. So you're going along and you're step and you do one, two, because it's overlaying three's hologram on four. You forgot to do three. Right. Your site immediately gives away you've made an error. If it wasn't for the AI also telling you, hey, dummy, go back to three, you, you would you'd still do it with just sight alone. You would not make that error. Right. And that's how they're getting away with zero. So, so uh, Ralph, um, obviously, we got very excited. We jumped right into spatial computing and, and talking yeah. about augmented reality and virtual reality and holograms and things like that. Build a little context for our audience. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background. You're an entrepreneur. I looked at your LinkedIn profile and I kind of paused after the first four presents because there's a number of founding companies and involvement that, that you've had stock uh, series seven stock broker yeah. as well. Um, a, 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 a man of a man of excitement. I mean, when they say the world's most interesting man, you, your poster is like right up next to to the commercial because you you know, look, like there's a lot of interesting things going on in, the, in that background. So tell us a little bit about your background. As a braggart, I actually claim that the most interesting man in the world finds me fascinating. <laughs> I think so. You need to uh, change the LinkedIn bio then. <laughs> I've, I've had a very nice life in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, I'm a South Side boy. Uh, my grandfather had a grocery store down on uh, Pyatt Street where the freeway cuts through and breaks his business apart. So he, he goes and he becomes another businessman. He starts doing rental prop. And yeah, my whole family uh, had always done business in one way or another. But my parents were teachers. <laughs> my father taught business, actually, at YSU. As life went along, um, I wasn't what you would call together. I have ADD. I take the drugs even this morning before I got here. I still, you know, I have, a, I have that kind of thing. I had a hard time figuring out what I was going to do. Um, I would be willing to say I've been fired over 30 times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and especially in later years, most in earlier years, it was just because I was a screw up. In uh, later years, it was because the jobs I held, if you wanted to make a change in the company, well, there was nowhere else for me to go. I was at the top. Yeah. And uh, they move you along. You know, you don't get demoted to vice president. You right. Get, yeah. You get the door. So my later firings weren't from screwing up as much as from uh, uh, simply being in the top position and having to go. I've had good. So so I, I went through all that to say to you. I think a lot of entrepreneuring is like uh, invention. M the mother of it is necessity. Yeah. I needed a job and I couldn't get him. You know, I couldn't keep one. I had to be my unemployable. Own That's what it felt like to me. And, um, and I also had things I wanted to do. I became a stock. I, I, before and I need a real job. I mean, I don't have any. I haven't graduated from college and I'm not going to ever. And um, my 
I'm, you know, the Vietnam War is going on. I'm, I'm looking for a deferment. That's why I'm in college. The Vietnam War ends, so does my college career, and I'm married at that point. So one of my cousins runs an insurance agency and I become an insurance agent. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not that I can't understand things. It's more like uh, I'm emotionally retarded at this point. And uh, that leads to me becoming a stockbroker, it turns out. And that um, gives you quite a bit of credibility. You know, I, I have to tell you, when you're an insurance agent and you're in a uh, cocktail party, Somebody says, what do you do? And you tell them, they find a reason to go to the men's room or the ladies' room or I got to freshen my drink. I'll be, oh, Marge. <laughs> um, when you say I'm a stockbroker, they lean in. Yeah. Okay. I've been going to cocktail parties and having people walk away because I was a life insurance agent. Now they were stay, sticking around. And that was a lot of fun. My wife and I actually did our honeymoon in Pittsburgh, Seven Springs, but we also spent time in Pittsburgh. And uh, we loved the town. And they had a business journal. And so did Cleveland. We didn't care much for Cleveland. My wife was a Steelers fan. I became a Steelers fan. And, um, but their business journal was really interesting. And I had enough pride in Youngstown to make a decision that, Youngstown was going to have a business journal. It was an interesting time, too, because it's 1984. It's the bottom of the economy. Right, right. Uh, it's the bottom. <clears throat> In fact, we managed to publish uh, the first copy of the business journal at the very month of the bottom of the economy, which will be July, August. And um, But before we got to that point, I'm looking at Youngstown wondering why they couldn't have a business journal. And I get back here and try putting one together. And um, everyone tells me why, because we don't have enough business. Um, but that wasn't really true. As a broker, you find out about the money. Incredible wealth here. Right. Incredible. Uh, it is there. I, I won't tell you a name, but you can imagine. Um, well, there was a fellow who got a $35 million check less than a month ago in this town. There is a person in this community who has $5 billion in cash on deposit. Okay. There are people, the number of millionaires would astound you. And all you have to do is look around to try and understand. What's directly northeast of us is a little city called Oil City, Pennsylvania. Right. How many brokerage firms are there in downtown Youngstown? Do you know? I think the number is zero right now. Used to have about six. Okay. okay. There's five in Oil City. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they, it, its name came after its event? That's where Rockefeller drilled for oil in the, for, in the United States first. He left there to go to Texas, but he hit there. Right. And he became successful there. And all of those landowners have every bit of royalties he paid them. And their, you know, confirmation money, as the phrase goes. Right. They didn't have to spend it. They became investors. They had lots. And, and some of them were still getting royalties. There's wells. We're at the bottom of the Alleghenies. So the glacier pushes all this crap right up against the mountain and, and, and it becomes oil. Right. However, that process. And that's why we have uh, shale throughout, et cetera. But there's places where you can go down 200 feet and you hit oil. It's spurting out the top and they had wooden derricks. And, well, that money never left the area. Who was Ohio's Civil War governor? His name was Todd. You know that name at all? There's somebody buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. That's him, Governor Todd. Governor Todd and his family built a company called Youngstown Sheet and Two. David Todd III, I am happy to say, um, him and Dan Roth formed a firm called Torrent. It was a venture capital firm. They actually gave me money on one of my ventures that, that failed. But I became friends with David and Dan and... Um, Later on, uh, when David told me stories, 
But one of the ones I really enjoyed was when LTV bought Youngstown Sheet and Tube, one of the huge checks that was written out was written out to David Todd. Um, they owned Youngstown Sheet and Tube. But yes, they allowed it to go public, but by and large, they still owned it. None of that money is left here. David lives in Cleveland. His son now lives in Cleveland. David just died three, four years ago. Until he did, that money was still here. Right. I'm saying to you, in other words, here I am in 84. I know all of this, but at the same time, the economy is really bad. Right. I took a flyer. I had enough money and enough um, music man in me to talk people into doing things. You know, it's not fraud if you pull it off. Right. <laughs> That's the difference between a music man and an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur will try and pull it off. The music man's just conning people. Right. Um, I think that you have to be very careful there, but I think you can't say you're being absolutely truthful when you say to somebody, I know it's going to work. Well, maybe you do, but that shouldn't mean anything to you. Your opinion and my opinion are strong in ourselves, but you're asking somebody to risk money. You just have to lie. <laughs> and and lie with the intent of delivering. I mean, sure. You know, but right, right, right. Nobody gives money to somebody who says, Well, well if we can do it, uh, they give money to people who say, I know exactly what I'm doing, and I know how this is gonna work, and even if I don't, I'll manage. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, Bob Marley song. You, you can fool one person some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Right. So if you want, if, if you're in it for the one time hit, it better be a big hit because otherwise you're going to, you need a lot of singles, right? Hey, baseball, hey, the baseball is, and you don't get them and you don't get them because the word of mouth, if you don't deliver. Right. Right. So there is, to what you're saying, though, is every, I, I mean, look, I, I've got three businesses. Um, one of them, I mean, two, two of them started just conceptually. You're an entrepreneur. And people, people invested into that concept before it ever became like it was it was just a concept. It was air. It was air. And we delivered. And then that was that's why it went on to version two, version three and so forth and so on. But if we would have just took and never delivered, we've never obviously been around for the rest of it. I don't use non-disclosure agreements unless I'm dealing with a big company I'll, because people can't execute. Right? Right, right, right. You can't. That's, the, that's what your skill was when you created those two companies right. that made people give you money. They looked at you and thought, oh, he's going to do this. He's going he's gonna to give it his best effort. That, that's all you can ask of somebody. Right. And that's the decision they came to. That's why when I said, yeah, Dan and David lost their money, but we were friends. They were big boys. They weren't wearing short pants when they gave me money. Sure. And they watched me and they saw that I lost. At the time, I lost everything. So I wasn't faking it. I was doing right. my best. It just didn't work. The Congress actually changed a law that we were counting on in the middle of the whole thing. And Everything fell apart. Sure. You could get away with that once or twice. That's just bad luck. Right. Three times, you're apparently bad luck. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and you do anything that smacks of not having given your best and lost people's money, and you didn't walk away poorer, you can't do that twice. Right. Not in the same town which is why the music man was always traveling, right? You can't do that. Yeah. So anyhow, just a, that was how, that was how I decided to go ahead with the business or almost I, I made the determination that there was plenty of money here and they'd be interested in the kind of stuff we were putting out. Right. At the time you couldn't get mortgage rates. You didn't know what a bank was, didn't know what CD rates. You had to call the banks up. They'd advertise them, but not together, not in a way you could compare. We started doing those things. I was able to talk Andrea into becoming the editor. And uh, and it's 40 years later. It'll be, um, let's see, 40 years. Yeah. 
to bring that kind of conversation full circle, um, so we're sitting in the Youngstown Business Incubator, and I moved back to Youngstown. My daughter will be nine, so we moved back nine years ago, and that's when I that's when I officially started my first marketing agency. I uh, fired my boss in corporate America um, two weeks after she was born. There was an exit strategy. Sure. And and uh, I had been involved in small, mid-sized business. I had partnered with some venture capital. So I got the intoxication of that. I started my first business at 13, working at GE <laughs> Healthcare during the downturn of the um, of the recession was a good place to go hide out for three or four years. Right. Built was was planning the day I walked in. I was planning on what I was going to build in, in next, and this leads us into kind of the blockchain and whatnot. But we move back. Jim Costner gives me a home here in the YBI. And then shortly then after, he says, hey, Andrew Wood from the Business Journal would like to come talk to you. They're having a problem with this uh, search engine optimization with the Business Journal. It turned out they, they were having more of a challenge with the digital platform. So about six years ago, I got engaged with the Business Journal and helped them to revamp the online platform that laid a lot of the architecture to where, uh, where and what you see today. Oh, that's a nice job you do. Thank you. I wasn't there by that time. I had sold off to Andrea, but a that couple, was really well done. A couple of people that have come in behind me, I feel like have taken it, you know, they, they got into the fully built car and and really took it to the next level. Mm -hmm. But I, I really laid that groundwork and, uh, you know, like new website and things like that. But anyway, and, and that all started here where we're at in, 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 in the incubator. I was I was running C Boss at that point. Um, Jim Jim had just started down here, and I didn't think he was nuts at all. I thought he was a music man, by the way, uh, not the corrupt kind, but sure the the kind that was planning on delivery. But he was a music man nonetheless. Remember, it's nineteen ninety four or five, right in that range, and he's telling Youngstown who for 20 years, the FBI has just come through and wiped out every county office holder. Yep. One out of every office goes to jail. Finally. And, and things are turning around, if you will. Okay, so from 1970 to 1990s, early 90s, the mob has made it so that nada happens. Yep. We lost the mills and nothing else is there. They're just sucking us dry. FBI comes through. We get, um, we get rid of Trafficant, we get um, Ryan, we get Costler here, and we get Tom Humphreys over at, well, he's going to be there in another two years. Uh, Moliterno's there right now, and I have CBOSS up and running, and Costler is going to try and sell Youngstown on the idea that it will be a, um, it will be a software center. Right. And he manages to convince the people who were running this incubator, their board, that it should happen. And, and I think that was easy to do because everyone prior to him had been talk, acting like somehow they were going to bring back steel. And that was not going to happen. Do you realize, do you realize when the mills closed, we could not get a $20 million loan, venture fund, any grant from anyone. And we had the opportunity to buy the mills and run. There was a coalition that wanted to buy them and run them as a uh, worker cooperative. And they couldn't get $20 million. Today, we get a $20 million grant about daily in Youngstown. Okay, so the difference between the kind of things that was happening then and now. Yeah. And Costler starts selling this story. And I'm a believer because what am I doing? I'm running a software company. We made, you buy your license plates online, you're welcome. We made that site. It's called O Plates. Okay. We were, we were uh, not only providing internet access, but we had internet programmers. We made several state systems. And I believe that Youngstown could do that. I was hiring, all of my staff came from Youngstown. Right. I, knew. I had a little trouble finding them, but I have a method that works. I pay them more. 
I steal, I just go find somebody who's doing it somewhere else and doing it well. And I ask them how much they're making and I give them more money and their employers, you know, start telling security guards, I'm not allowed on the premises, but I don't care. I I'll find them when they come out of work. This slavery is not allowed here. And this is an incremental cost. You realize the difference in getting a good program or, or not having one at all or having a bad one. The difference is maybe 20 grand a year on top of whatever the bad one's getting to get the good one. Right. The difference in what the good one will put out is $20 million a year that you could make off of their work. Sure. Okay. It doesn't matter if they're making 80 now and you promise them 160 to get them. It doesn't matter to you as a businessman because you're doing a project that should be bringing in 40, 50 times that kind of money. X. Yeah. So so let me ask you this question. And, and again, we're going to get into NFTs, metaverse, and all that good stuff here. There, the, I, think, I think that there's this. Um, so in 1990, 91, there was also the height of the crack epidemic. We had gangs coming in from Detroit. It had a very big impact on our city. Crime was up definitely as well. Oh, yeah. I, I actually was enrolled at YSU. And I went off to college. I was going to go to YSU. Ended up leaving town. Um, kind of had to go see the world. Right. And went from Canton to Cleveland to New York City to Columbus. Jim has me back. Jim doesn't have me back, but he sent an email out to he sent an email out to a lot of people. Youngstown diaspora. Email. And come back and visit us when you're in town for Christmas. And I fell in love with that idea. Um, and I did. I came back and visited and I and I toured and I listened to what he had, and I was like, wow, there's a lot going on here. There's a pulse, right? But the one thing that I've always kind of had this um I'll say disagreement with is that there's this belief that you can have a lower paying salary because the cost of living in Youngstown, Ohio is less than what it is in Silicon Valley, in a New York City, in some of the bigger cities. So you can have top talent come here, work for less, but you have more. And I kind of I kind of poo poo that idea to a certain extent, because outside of housing, Outside of a how what a house costs here, the cost of living here isn't that much different than what it is in New York or Columbus. Piece of pizza costs what a piece of pizza costs. But like, you still have longer transportation and parking. And we have to have two cars. Now my family just now went, we've I, gone virtual too, though, and so that may not be a factor. Sure. So I was a one car family for a very long time with four kids, which is unheard of in this day and age. It really is. But I really, but 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 it's a convenience factor too. Like car, right. two cars, like my wife and I's communication. We just added a second car has diminished in the past two months because we'd have to talk and plan our day about who needs the car, where are the kids going, and what and like what is the day like. I don't believe that we should have to have this Youngstown economy that we charge less for advertising we charge less for a steak dinner we charge less for a bottle of wine we charge less like if you're a top talent you should get top talent money and the percentages shouldn't be such a differentiation between what you can get here and what you can get in a market like a new york or a a california the problem is though that your employer is selling here if he is smart enough to go outside it. See, I like the idea of hiring here and selling out of here. I don't want to sell. I'll sell to people here in this, in this newer business with the uh, headsets, et cetera. Certainly I'll sell locally, but I don't intend to just sell locally. When I, when I get a big entity to buy from me, what occurs to me is there's more big entities out there. I just hit the local one. I want to go now and get the one in Cleveland. And I, you know, maybe I sold a uh, auto parts store and all of a sudden I found out they need what I'm selling. Oh, well, there's auto parts stores all over the country. That's the way to use your talent that is costing you less or uh, is enjoying a, a lifestyle. By the way, I think the house is a big, big deal. Don't forget, and look at the homes we have on the south side of Youngstown that you could buy for 10 grand. Sure. In 
San Francisco, if they were in repair, they start at two million because of now that's the they're extreme. Buying the, they're buying the lot. Right. Right. We're tearing the house down. That's a big that can make a big difference to a family. Other than that, yeah, you're right. Gasoline costs the same, though you I, I'm driving more now because I live in Poland than I've ever driven to come to work. Sure. Or come down here. Right. I don't have any parking costs though. In Cleveland, I'd be paying how much? 10 at least, maybe 20. How much a day could it cost in Cleveland to park? I imagine starts at five. 20. Okay, that's a lot of money over a month. Um, right. And here I don't have any of that. I get a ticket occasionally. You have to pay 10 bucks because I, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, all of that matters. I agree with you, though. I think it is not fair to find yourself in a position where you're, you've come back here, perhaps to take care of your parents. You were billing out at 75 bucks an hour. You were billing out at 200 an hour, whatever you were billing out at. Yeah. And you come here and you're reducing it by 70%. You know, you're down to $30 an hour or something. Well, that's just wrong. You're, you're look. I think you're looking at the wrong market. If you're putting yourself in that position. Yeah. Better yet, why don't you help the rest of us when you come back? If you're making 200 wherever you are, charge 200 here. Right. We have people who could pay it. Give them a reason to. Right. Be the quality you think you are. Right. Okay. Be worth 200 bucks an hour. Like what I said, I'll pay somebody that kind of money if they're working on a $20 million deal. Yep. But um, you'd be helping the rest of us out if you came back, Mr. San Francisco and well, check that, up residence here and kept charging that amount. Well, that was the music man's talk to me. He said, we want you to take what you've learned everywhere else. And at the time, too, I was I was working at GE and I was in all the top hospitals uh, in the United States. You know, I was in the Johns Hopkins. I was in the Stanford's. I was in the Cleveland clinics. He said, I want you to take all that technology and all that business. And we want I want you to bring it back to Youngstown. And, and, and teach us what you've learned there. And he was I, so good at that. And it, and you know what? Not even Catholic guilt from a, mm. you know, a mother-in-law and a, and a mom added mm. up to that. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about metaverse. Yeah. Let's talk about NFTs and blockchain. For those of you that do not know, let, let's give the quick um, 101 into metaverse. We'll move it into, into NFTs, crypto, blockchain. Uh, let's talk about that metaverse first. Isn't it interesting that all of a sudden they're acting like the metaverse just got bored? Sure. Um, I can't I can't make my definition different uh, than what I'm going to give you because I can't see the difference in what they think has happened other than more people are entering virtual reality. Okay, because the metaverse is clearly the idea that um, you're working with spatial computing, you're going to be going into virtual worlds, even if it's through this screen, sure. you're going to be going into them and operating in 3D mode. But Second Life, one of the first virtual reality worlds, is over 25 years old. Okay, um, and so what exactly was the birth moment of the metaverse? I think it's 1962 when Walter Riston puts on a public network all the United States money. He's the president of Citicorp, and he decides that money's going electronic. And so you have, for the first time on public networks, substantive content going back and forth. And it's on a public network. I mean, Private in that you had to have a big mainframe computer, right. but public in that these are AT and T lines he's running. It's the original internet, if you will. Right. And right then is when you have the metaverse born, because now you, all of that data and everything that's happened since is a part of what's going on. So people are trying to make the definition: Hey, this is something that happened in the 2020s. No, no, it couldn't have been then. It might have been back at Second Life if you want to limit it to 3D. And even before then, there was stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. Where, but if you really want to talk about what the metaverse is, it's connectivity and data 
in in a way that impacts your life almost immersively right that would be the better word i hate using virtual or augmented you're immersing immersing yourself into what is essentially data whether it's social media data and you're carrying on conversations with people or you're actually doing some work um, and you're you're taking cloud data from 30 different sources and it's ending up in your hands stuff that never could have been done before look at your imagine if you really wanted to go back to high school imagine the reports you turn in now with google you couldn't you'd go to your school library and you'd find a book or two you go to the public library and find four books on the subject you're you're given a fire hose of books when you google that subject today it all of this stuff is what is now being billed as the metaverse and what is really more the fact that we have found easier ways to get this data into individual hands. And one of the easier ways is spatial computing. We make it so that it's visual, it's auditory. Um, if you had kept that on, they were going to let you play with holograms. Right. You'd be able to touch them, move them, make them bigger, bring them to. And they, right. You know, we, we all of a sudden now think that the metaverse has been born. Um, you're of a generation, and please don't take this the wrong way. I'm 70. <laughs> of a lot of people are a, a lot of people um, are saying, you know, get off my front lawn, right? Um, why don't you just go out and play with somebody in person? You know what I mean? Like, the, the, is is the metaverse going to make us closer together in its intent, and at the at the same time, is that technology going to disconnect us even more from the human touch? That same old crotchety man tells you to get off of his lawn, goes inside the house, opens his laptop, and talks to his grandson in Illinois. Right. Technology is what you make of it. I think of it as ennobling. I think of it as something that gives grandparents the chance to see a grandchild that they may not have been able to see. Look at how it allowed us to stay in touch when being in touch could kill you. Um, our society has gotten, let's, let's call it dystopian, okay? Whether you like guns or not, we have approximately a half a billion of them in the United States. We have a pandemic going on. We have child molesters. We have Republicans telling you that gangs are roving your cities. Uh, people are on edge. I know when the pandemic started as, as somebody, I'm a Democrat liberal, okay? When the pandemic started, somebody asked me if I was missing seeing people. And I pointed out to them that, you know, I was pissed off at about half of the American population right then and there permanently for what they had done in electing Trump. So I didn't give a damn if I saw those people at all. I think that's almost an attitude that people have anymore. Yeah, they they like the touchy feely, but they don't really want to be with you. That's why they're adding money to their own homes. Okay, they want to be with their own. They want to. They don't mind touching their family, but they're not quite sure that they want their family touching anybody else anymore. They're not quite sure they even want their kids hanging around a grocery store where people are being shot. You know, uh, on the job site, you take the risk that somebody's going to walk in who got fired last week and open fire. Sure. Uh, make a comment about Trump like I just did and have your address public. And what are you really risking? <laughs> Somebody may drive by your house and shoot into it. I hate to laugh about it, but I, and I don't laugh about it in a disparaging way. Like I, I, I laugh because I think that, frankly, both sides have, if, I'm an independent. I'm, I'm an independent, and and um, and there's a reason behind that. There, there's well, first of all, liberal arts education, 
And I don't know if I don't know if if the spice of the variety found me or if that was a part of like I, I think that both of it, right? But um I tried to I tried to just look at that world and not get too far this way or that way. And what what can I control in my house, which is my beliefs? How does that how does that function? And I do think that both have have gone haywire. Um, I would think that you can't look at it rationally and compare them. They're not comparable anymore. One has gone off the deep end. The other is still nuts. I'm not telling you that's untrue, but there's a difference between nuts and psychotic. Sure. And I think that's what I'm trying to say is that if you felt they were both at extremes, one has seemed to ratchet up the, the extreme a bit. Um, we don't, I, I can't name in the Democratic Party a Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, a Gates, um, a Jim Jordan. Um, I could think of AOC and that woman who wears the hijab. They seem to get everyone on the right PO'd all the time, but they don't seem to talk about anybody else because we don't have anybody running around making crazy statements about uh, Israeli or Italian lasers starting, you know, none of that stuff. That kind of thing. When I don't want to talk politics either. The reason right. I brought that up no, was no, to say to you, People are like edgy over all this stuff. Right. So I'm not convinced that they actually want to go out and meet people as much as they used to. Right. Uh, number one. Number two, there's a big difference between using this. Yeah. When I meet with somebody with this on, I've noticed it too. When I zoom with somebody, it is a little flat. You're looking at, well, look, you're looking at a TV screen, right? That's all you're doing. You're looking at a TV screen and it's flat in front of you. And we have 50 years of experience with that. It's not, it's right. not somebody you could touch. That's ingrained in us. When some when somebody is virtual with you and you could reach out, and when you touch them, they glow where you hit there and the sound is made. Or you can sit here and, and actually feel like you're talking to them. Right. People take those off and turn around and say, it was like being there. So, so yeah, and, and at one point, remember when, um, I think it was Cisco, and they probably still do this to a certain extent, they would come in and sell you like a $100,000 room and would have a, a, you'd be in this room and you'd have a panel of cameras. And so the big, the big move in the technology was this. If you were the one talking, you would pop up on the screen. And then if somebody else was talking yeah. and they would they were going in and selling people a hundred thousand dollars for a room that was this interact and then that's really all as it was. Yeah. And now this is that technology is literally would you want it in, in Google Meets, you want it in Zoom, like basically speaker profile, and it will pick up and that's the person that gets the floor. So we 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 take that and 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 have like all technology. As technology progresses, it becomes more accessible, more affordable. Um, um, Everyone's using Zoom. Everybody's using Zoom. So, so NFTs. Why yeah. for the those of people that do not understand NFTs, why do I want to own the rights to the piece of digital art? For the same reason you always have wanted to own did any art, okay? Because you like it and you think it's valuable. And, and there may be a reality to both of those, okay? It may be liked by a lot of people, and it may be considered valuable beyond just how you feel. In other words, there's a market for it. An NFT is a non-fungible token. That's what those letters stand for. Yep. And non-fungible means that it's not like a drop of water where you put a drop of water into a gallon and you can't tell the difference from one drop to the next. If an NFT was a drop of something and you put it into a gallon of other liquid, you'd be able to discern it from the rest of the other drops in that gallon. Right. Non-fungible. That's what that part means. The token part just means that it, it has a uh, identification to it. And that's related to blockchain. Blockchain is Jenga. Okay. The game Jenga. Right. You put the money in. And you can't get them, you really can't get one out and put 
a different one in there. And the same is true of blockchain. When a transaction takes place, it's laid down on one at the top. Right. And another one goes right over top. And you can't change that transaction. It becomes it becomes something that could be authenticated. Right. We know this is real because here's where it is. And it couldn't be changed once it was put there. That's what blockchain does. And blockchain, so NFTs have a blockchain identification to them. So they're unique and they can be um, they can be proven to be unique. They can be authenticated. So that's what gives you when you own an NFT, even though you could drag and drop, anybody could drag and drop the image off your website and they have the same image it looks like, right. you can prove you own the original. So you might do it for that. If, if uh, Leonardo da Vinci was making NFTs, you would buy the Mona Lisa from them because you liked it and because other people wanted it and you thought it was valuable. Right. You're going to do the same thing now or you're going to speculate, which means there's no logic behind how much value you're investing. It, well, you know, it's it's it, so back in 2017, we had a keynote speaker at my marketing conference um, that was talking about marketing and blockchain and, and, and everybody in the audience just sat there like this. Right. With a glazed look. <laughs> right. And now in 2022, it, it, it's actually hitting the market. There's websites that you could trade NFTs with blockchain. Um, you know, it's why Obey Giant Stuart Freely, um, the street artist, for those of you that do not know him, basically copped a picture off of Google. And he created the Obama Hope poster. So oh. when Obama, when, when when in in President Obama's first run at president, he created the poster Hope. The Obama administration uh, endorsed that immediately. Like it was a great oh, I love it. Great rally cry, right? Well, then it turned out that such a, a tremendous amount of controversy ensued that, and they had to try to figure out a way to distance themselves, but they couldn't because Stuart Freely, the street artist, basically took a picture off of Google, and he did what he did to the poster, which is really cool because we've actually done it with our logo. Yeah. We actually took our, our logo. We said, let's copy the Hope poster. It's really cool. Um, and it and so when the NFT world. You take down the dots per inch to do that, right? You're talking about the way they posterized it. Right. The yeah. Way they posterized That's it. a really nice. It's almost right. like a filter. Right. But the point was, is that he got that. He got that by taking a photo off of Google oh, no. with NFT and this particular world that we're going towards now that you can actually then get credit for the content that you create and purchase in the digital world. Right. And the other thing that you can do, you just, you just made the point that you can authenticate Authentic. what you've done. You can also authenticate who you are because of blockchain. And that's a huge difference right. in the online world. How do you know that the person on Facebook is, is really, it says real Donald Trump, but how do I know that's really people, him? People don't realize it too, that every day they're leveraging the blockchain. So if they go to say a pay app, like mm -hmm. a Venmo, um, if they're, right now I, I outsource some work um, you know, across the world. And so all, all the payment processing that you see is part of the blockchain technology. But getting back into NFTs, I really do think that the biggest play, at least like I'm trying to figure out. So we had virtual reality um, very early on 2016, 2017 at our conference as well. And here's me saying like you really need to get behind VR in your marketing strategy because this is where the world's going. And it wasn't that early, but it was fairly early. And then just like. Back in January or February, I hired um, a local photographer to come in and Matterport a home. Who? Oh. Uh, actually, it's a co company I work with in a market that are residential kitchen business. So we matched and gave a virtual tour mm -hmm. of the kitchen. So you're immersed now in the metaverse. So you can see what that kitchen looks like if you were to buy that, if you were to buy that exact same kitchen. And in 2016 to do that it was clunky it was expensive and in 2022 it cost me less than 100 bucks to basically get the kitchen matter ported and get that displaced everywhere we wanted it to go 
But I also think that there's a big play for events. Huge. Huge play for events. So if I am able to create 100 NFTs um, for my conference, and as a result of buying that NFT, you own that in perpetuity or maybe for a, a lifetime, I could also, and you could, so now Ralph buys a ticket to do yo, and now you could through the blockchain take that same ticket, that that digital ticket, and sell it. It's an NFT in and of itself. It's an NFT in itself, as opposed to, well, I kind of got this and can't that. be counterfeited, by and, the way. And, and here's the other thing, too. So you now you could actually, I could set it up so I can make a royalty in perpetuity off of that as well. Yes. So like in scalping, you have a ticket to you have a ticket to an event. <laughs> You take that and you, it goes up, goes down, whatever. But as the owner of that original digital ticket, I can actually make a royalty every time you move that through the blockchain. You could. Um, You'd have to get somebody to agree to that on the to, other side. You have but to get yes. somebody to agree to that. Um, and then I could set up unique experiences with your ticket through that NFT as well. Yes. And you could, you know, it's, it's hard to overemphasize this. Um, because it's so important. But in a world that's 3D, when you're in a virtual world, and we're saying that this is where people are going, the imagery is is the content. Okay? What's a, your, your entire environment, somebody's making that. That is a piece of art that they're entitled to have their, their rights to. Right. Well, now they do. And while you as a person may rip off their, their art, drag and drop it. Me as a company will find myself in court if I try and do that. Okay. I, I have to stay in a location. I'm not allowed to s steal and run. I have to stay in a place <laughs> where my customers can find me. Yeah. So if I steal and I'm using it and you, it's yours and you find that, I'm going to be in a location you can sue me at. Right. I can't do that. That's where this really becomes important. Up till now, you didn't know where you didn't know who owned the cop, the the trademark or the copyright. Today, you know that somebody does, and they have the proof of it. Right, and they could take you to court. It's an it's an incredibly complicated and complex thing to understand. People are really not. Uh, gravitating or taking it serious and i understand why but it also is reminding me early days of the internet as well um at Somebody a time we paid a lot of money to live next to snoop dog right you hear about those transactions those are nfts essentially right land okay in the metaverse is an nft right uh, did somebody pay a million dollars to move next door to him <laughs> that's why did they do that? Well, <laughs> so, so, so I had a conversation last week too, like, um, you know, about creating a mastermind group and, and, and you know, I, I gave it thought and it's like, people are willing to pay for access to a group that can bring them value. And 10, and if that value is not just, it's not knowledge share, but the other maybe 10 people that are part of that group now form this relationship, um, then it's access. Algonquin Roundtable, you all of a sudden are a member of a prestigious group like that? Yeah. What's it worth? Does it have to deliver any money today for you to pay $10,000 to have your seat at that table? No. Nope. Not if you're not if you're somebody who knows the value of what that will mean after five years sitting at that table. Oh, you know, you know, and and it's so funny too because I think that the lifetime value is is um, the relationship, and I think so many people think that you know, like from my perspective, when I've been the person that gets the call five years later, mm -hmm. and I'm always I never even ask why he didn't call me thirty <laughs> days later. Like, I'm like, that's the play that I'm always in for is I don't want, I mean, if you need me today, great. But really at the end of the day, I want to be the, I want to be the person that you think of a year, three years, five, 10 years down the road that 
that can bring you that value. Maybe not today transactionally. Not everyone could be your customer today, but when they can be, if they still remember you, it's worth a fortune. It's worth a fortune. You said um, millions of millions of virtual property skills to be successful. As we get to the bottom of the hour, got about another ten or so minutes. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Ralph. Me too. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad that you. Yeah, I I could do a weekly podcast with you <laughs> and we would just, and then we bring a third person in and we'd have an, ama an amazing, uh, amazing podcast. Tom Humphrey. So if you ever talk to him, grab him. He's retired now. So Tom, Tom was very instrumental in one of the concepts. Um, so do you live was this idea that I had that I would bring a marketing conference to Youngstown, Ohio. I wanted to get my name out there. Um, I had moved back. There was established agencies. They weren't really doing content, digital lead generation strategy. They were still primarily focused on ad buys as agencies, uh, you know, lived off of and creative services. And I have been speaking at a marketing conference in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. I was in the basement. Um, very hard to get to if you've ever been to Rochester, middle of nowhere. <coughs> and, um, I'm sitting there talking about utilizing social media in healthcare marketing, which I've been on the forefront of that. And so conference ends, about 200, 300 people were there and the planes delayed then the planes canceled and then I'm on a bus and they're, they're driving us up through cow country to uh, the twin cities and beautiful ride. Otherwise I've never, I would have never taken it. So I did, I did enjoy it. Beautiful Ooh, country. Yeah. But I poured myself in the bed at two o'clock in the morning. I was living back in Youngstown, just moved back. And I had thought about a, an event and I put the business plan back away and I got it out. And it was half baked. And and I that was just enough to piss me off and give me enough motivation to say, you know what? If 300 people can find their way on planes to Rochester, <laughs> Minnesota to sit in the basement for two days. We have enough resources right here in Youngstown, Ohio, and, and where we're at, and we have a ton of talented people. Why not here? Um, I was told by, and I, I won't mention the names, that Youngstown is not a conference town. Don't pursue it. It's a bad idea. Why don't you start small? Maybe a workshop here or there. Um so I built. I hate weapon. ideas like that. Don't you hate advice <laughs> like that? You just want to tell them why? Why did you even open your mouth? But you want to be polite. But it's the motivation. Sometimes it's motivation. Maybe I don't know. So I went to. I built a website. Said we're coming this year. Then we're coming in the summer. Then we got our keynote speaker. We built around that. A month into that, I got an introduction to Tom, and I went in and I said, "Here's what I'm looking to do." And he didn't say anything like that crap you had heard up till that point, did he? I'm just guessing. He didn't say to you, start small. Not at all. No. The only thing he did say to me was this. He said, how much you, know, how much are you looking for? And, it, and I said, look, really at the end of the day, the sponsorship would be $5,000. And that's going to really pay for just about everything that we got. And I would hope that we get 100 people to sign up. I said, but that's what I, that's what I need to cover all the expenses. And then we'll, we'll figure out from there. He says to me before he, he agrees, or he says, you know, I or he says, I really like billboards. So I'm doing a digital marketing conference. It's all about, you know, digital strategy. But I, I really like marketing in general, just so that it's disruptive and not necessarily got to be digital. He goes, yeah, but I really like billboards. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. Because I'm not saying I'm not going to support you. I said, well, I said, to know, let you know that I'm not a complete kiss butt. I said, I think billboards are an incredible waste of money unless you have gobbles of money. If you have a ton of money to throw out a problem, I think billboards are a great way to go market your business. But if you're lean and you don't have a lot of money, like the internet's almost virtually free outside of your time. And uh, he said, I think you're going to bring a lot of value to the members of our chamber of commerce. I think you're going to bring a lot of value to the city of Youngstown for what you're doing. And you definitely have our support. So, you know, and it was, that was, I mean, you know, without, I mean, we, I mean, you can ask for anything more. No, he's he'd be a great third if you ever wanted to do that. Um, the skills that are going to be needed are, there's always one that I want to point out to everybody. 
Learn how to gain different vocabularies. Honestly, I will tell all of your listeners now, I don't have any technical abilities whatsoever. I can't program. I can't solder. I can't design. Um, but I read and I learn the words. And I have always, somebody, I found this out when I went to become a broker. My boss said, I, I was going, this is gibberish. I, I can't, an indent, a debenture, a bond, a uh, variable annuity. It, this is like, he said, here's what's going to happen. You know, you have to, you have to train for six months before you're allowed to take the test and you have to yeah. be under a, 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 a federally uh, a licensed broker to do that. He says, here's what's going to be ha happen. About three to six months out, you're going to wake up one morning, be shaving, and the news is going to come on and they're going to do the stock market report. And you're going to understand every word of it. Okay. And I'll be damned if that didn't happen. And, and it was just that. If you could pick up the vocabulary, then you understand enough to do something in that industry, to understand where you can make out, where you can't. And you can at least talk to the people in that industry. And if you just throw out a few words and then keep your mouth shut, they don't realize you're an idiot. And they talk to you <laughs> as if you know what you're doing. And they tell you things that, you, that are actionable by you. So that skill you always need. You better get used to the fact that you're not going to stop reading or assimilating information. Those days are gone. If you want to get a skill and stop learning for the rest of your life, I suggest the skill you get is how to be a vegetable because you're not going to be a living human. You're going to look, you're just not going to be able to deal with the world that's coming. And then from there, if you could do anything like coding, uh, web page design, the kind of coding that's involved with that as a young age. If you could learn how to do HTML, if you could learn how to do one of two languages, Unity or Unreal Engine, those are the languages of the metaverse. You're assured of it right now. Um, right now, there is nobody who understands those things that is not fully employed and doesn't have people like me walking in and going, how much you making? I'll give you more. All of those people are in demand right now. Um, beyond that, any computing skill is valuable. If you want, you can go to the Microsoft.com site and they will train you for free in any of their programs. And people pay good money to learn <coughs> Word and Excel. You can have a free version of any of their programs off the cloud. You won't have it on your desktop, but you can use their products off the cloud, learn them. If you could claim to be an expert in Word or Excel, there's a $40,000 to $50,000 job waiting for you in Youngstown somewhere. Okay, just that those that little uh, skill right there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you like, I, I mean, I have handful of people that are doing various things for me and excel like building like that's one of them because I, I don't have that skill if you could learn it you you probably do and don't know it it's it's essentially filling out rows and columns let me okay? give you this <laughs> let me give you this one though i think it's adaptation i think i'm you know i'm sitting across oh, that's a great skill to have. from uh, an individual here that you know is talking metaverse nfts where i think the minority of 20, the people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, very small percentage of people in their 40s are even thinking about NFTs. I think that, you know, to, I, I don't know, <coughs> lifelong, that? thank you, lifelong adaptation is incredibly important. Oh, yeah, you can't. Evolving. Things are moving so fast. Um, it's a funny thing. I When I was a broker, Back in 78, there was a guy named Charlie O'Hay, an analyst, and he said, it's a whole new ball game that's coming. And he had understood what was going to happen when people started putting aside their own retirement money. IRAs had just started. Yeah. But he had projected out and realized that it was going to drive the market. So much money was going to have to go into the market 
that it was going to be a bull market and that it was he was the first guy who said the market's going to break 10,000 on the Dow. Up to that point, it was in the fours, five, sixes. It was at seven at that point. Yeah. And um, it's at 30 something today. And I'm telling you, the metaverse is going to take that to 90. It's that kind of a change we're looking at, not one that's incremental, but one that's radical. Well, well, you know, and you've got to you've got to adapt, as you were saying. You, you've had E Trade for a very, very long time, two over two decades now. But now Robinhood, you know, and apps like Trading App <laughs> are sitting right on your phone. And the difference is is that there's also a gamification behind them as well. And the reason why a kid can't put down an iPhone or an iPad is not just simply because it's not like the TV. It's built with addictive qualities to pull you further down in. It's affecting parts of your brain with dopamine, things like that. Now, investing, obviously, in savings is a good thing. So creating that habit is a good thing. But, I mean, my, put it this way. My 13-year-old and my 11-year-old, they don't have Robinhood accounts, but they know what Robinhood is. And we are nominal money that they earn throw into stocks oh what a great habit for to get financial them literacy so like they know activision built call of duty <laughs> and they're like everybody plays call of duty this has got to be a good stock but we're going to find out and we're also going to find out about activision too as a company right boys so see they already have skills that you and i had to acquire and, and when we give this to a child and we've done so <clears throat> i have yet to have a child that isn't ahead of me on the instruction I, so i use grammarly as a crutch <clears throat> there and there get me every time Statistically, last week, I used 4,349 words in, obviously, type. Um, you used more unique words than 97% of the Grammarly users. When Ooh. I got that, I got that statistic in my writing. That's great. Across email, copy. I was like, man, all right. That's important. I, I was like, who, who knew? And yet... See, there's the kind of thing I said to you earlier. I think of technology as a nobly. That little thing that actually would have taken dozens of people to figure out in times past was given to you. And what did it do to your day? What did it do to the quality of your life to know that something you have found to be uh, take pride in that you were achieving? Who tells you that? The wife doesn't anymore. I'm married 50 years, I can tell you. You know, they're not the ones who are going to you. Boy, are you a bright one. <laughs> they know you too well. But your computer just said to you, you're doing a good job in an area that you like to be proficient in. Yes, sir. I think, um, I think we're not getting the fact that we are no longer homo sapiens. We are homo augmentus. This is a part of you. It's a part of your humanity. And well, unfortunately, unfortunately, Ralph, here's what I think. We're getting away from fire and instinct and hunting and gathering. And the reason is, is that we've become a, a because we we have one vehicle, our, our one family vehicle up until recently did not have the automatic trunk lid. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and and now it's like the luxuries that we have. Because we can. I mean, we have flavored water in a can. Like we have, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the <laughs> things that we have. You but. still get to make judgments though. <laughs> you don't have to buy flavored water. And you could say to yourself, aren't I a superior being? I'm not going to buy that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to instead drink this flavored water. It says here that there's peach that, mango uh, with energy in it. I thought that was a, I thought that was a juice. I didn't realize it was a it's water. It's a V8. Yeah. Uh, whatever. V8 now makes something that is that tastes good, which you couldn't say about their product as far as I was concerned up to this point. I don't like tomato juice, but this is 
This is sweet. Well, <laughs> Anyhow. Well, listen, I would love thank to have you. For I, having I, I'd love to have you back on. I really would. Anytime. And and maybe we'll get a few other people to come hang out with us. Yeah. Thank you for the YBI giving us a place to uh, do the live uh, podcast today. And uh, a lot of good things to come, my man. So thank you very much. Thanks thank for having you us for having me.